Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. Is there some echo? No. Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, web webinar by the IceCube Neutrino Observatory. We are here at the Institute of Discovery on the University of Wisconsin Madison campus. Fitting name. <clears throat> so let me first go through the program of what we are going to do. Obviously, we want to show you some, uh, some new results uh, from IceCube. Uh, we'll hear some opening remarks by Dr. Denise Caldwell, the director of the physics division at the National Science Foundation. We'll then hear a few words from Steve Ackerman, vice chancellor of research and graduate edu education at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And we'll then move on to the scientific presentations, um, which are Professor Justin Vandenbroek, University of Wisconsin, Professor Elisa Risconi at the Technical University of Munich, um, Hans Niederhausen, postdoctoral fellow at Michigan State University, and also uh, just he just moved from the tech, uh, to Munich, and uh, finally Ignacio Tabuada, professor at Georgia Institute of Technology, and also a spokesperson of the Ice Cube collaboration. And we'll then have some question and answer uh, session. So this uh, uh, journey for the search of cosmic neutrino sources at the South Pole started uh, pretty much like 30 years ago with the first photomultipliers that were put in the ice, first in Greenland and then with increasing frequency at the South, uh, at the South Pole for the Amanda experiment. And uh, pretty precisely 20 years ago, we embarked on this uh, amazing project of the construction of the ice cube neutrino observatory that took almost a decade by, and about a little more than 10 years ago, uh, we started regular operations of ice cube. And today we'll hear about new results from the 10 years of data. And uh, these results will go, these results will go, will be published tomorrow in the journal Science, uh, where we'll, that will describe the uh, evidence for neutrino emission from the nearby active galaxy NGC 1068, nearby galaxy means nearby on a cosmic scale. Still quite a bunch of light years away. You will hear about that. Um, so let's, uh, without further ado, let's hear about uh, the details now. Uh, do we have uh, steady point sources? Do we have a steady point source here? And uh, with that, I'll give it to, to Justin. Oh. Well, Grace, Denise, uh, Denise Caldwell. So, yeah, I don't see that there. Uh, yes, Denise Caldwell. I'm here. Which on Zoom? Yes, Denise. Hello. Hello. Good, good to hear you. I don't Hello. know that you have my video because you have me turned off. <laughs> Let's see if we can turn it on. Let's give it a moment. Um, we could, how about that, I'll let, the, I'll let Steve, Steve Ackerman go first and perhaps we'll, he'll buy us a few minutes and we'll, uh, we'll get that squared away. Does that sound good, Denise? That's fine with me, whatever suits you suits me. Okay, Steve. I love it when experiments get out of whack and we adapt and it all works out um, as we're demonstrating right now. So um, my name is Steve Ackerman. I'm the vice chancellor for research and graduate uh, education here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. For those of you who are here physically, welcome to Wisconsin uh, and to the university. And for those of you who are online and have a camera, uh, welcome virtually to uh, Wisconsin and in particular, the Wisconsin Institute of Discovery where this is uh, event is being um, held. I wanna, you know, I'm really here to say a couple of things. One of which how proud University of Wisconsin is and how grateful we are to be given the task to support this incredible endeavor called IceCube. With the construction of IceCube, the University of Wisconsin and our office 
in particular created the Wisconsin Ice Cube Particle Astrophysics Center or WIPEC as a place where a team of scientists and engineers can support the operations and maintenance of Ice Cube and the International Ice Cube Collaboration. When I think of Ice Cube, I often think of that DOM thing down there um, and the detector itself and the concept of drilling in the ice and putting all these things uh, into the ice. But you know, with, with data like this, with findings, with discoveries like this you're coming out with, it becomes very clear that Ice Cube is a heck of a lot more than just a detector. It is an observatory, one that's buried in the ice. And this observatory is not just about the detectors, it's also about the people who run it, the technical support, and the scientific collaborations that occur internationally. So congratulations to this Ice Cube team for this publication on this new discovery that reports on neutron neutrinos from a nearby galaxy. Discoveries as described in this paper requires a close collaboration and the supportive team effort. So collaborations also, as I understand it, and I'm limited, I'm an atmospheric scientist, so I understand scattering and the importance of averaging over long time periods. Um, and so this kind of finding where you have to process years and years of data is pretty impressive to me personally. So congratulations uh, on this. And I also want to uh, especially acknowledge the support of the National Science Foundation, as well as all the international collaborations um, uh, from folks across across the globe at a variety of in institutions, as well as all the scientists and technologists and engineers who put their creative energy into this scientific discovery. Congratulations. Um, how are we doing? Okay, uh, Denise, uh, are you still there? I'm here. Okay, then uh, please uh, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Albrecht and Steve, uh, for the opportunity to say just a few words. Ever since the first humans looked up at the night sky, the stars and the great out there have fascinated humanity, inspiring legends and stories that cross ages and cultures. Over millennia, advances in ideas and technology have enabled us to see ever deeper into the universe, almost to the very edge. Part of what we've learned is that the universe has multiple ways of communicating with us and revealing its secrets electromagnetic radiation, part of which we see as light from the stars, gravitational waves that shake the fabric of space, and elementary particles, such as protons, neutrons, and electrons that are spewed out by localized sources like galaxies. One of these elementary particles is the neutrino. Neutrinos permeate the universe, but unfortunately, neutrinos are very difficult to detect. So we have to work very hard to see them. The Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, ICNO, has solved this problem by using the massive ice layer at the South Pole as the, uh, as the detector material. Built and operated with support from NSF and our international partners, the ICNO has long proven its worth by delivering an ongoing collection of information. But oftentimes progress can seem agonizingly slow. Then you get a breakthrough, a discovery that not only represents a milestone in what we've been searching for, but also points to a new direction in which to move the science forward. Such is what you are going to hear about today. On behalf of the NSF, I would like to congratulate the junior and senior scientists to make up the Ice Cube collaboration on this achievement. NSF is very proud to have had a part in this endeavor, and we look forward to many more such occasions as Ice Cube moves into the next phase of operations. I leave it to the individuals 
who have dedicated their time, efforts, and talent to enable this discovery to tell you their story. So I thank you and turn it back over to Albrecht. Thank you very much, Denise. Thank you. And then with that, uh, that's uh, the other first speaker of the scientific program is uh, Justin, Justin van Broek. Thank you, Albert. I hope you can see me okay. Good afternoon. The universe is filled with billions of galaxies, many of which have in turn billions of stars, but that's not all they have. Most galaxies have giant black holes at their center, black holes which have masses millions to billions of times greater than our own sun. And in fact, in many cases, these black holes somehow power light emission and other forms of photon emission, which can outshine all the stars in their galaxies. So that's a fundamental paradox, a mystery. How can black holes power some of the most powerful emission of light in the universe? We don't understand how that happens. We think it might be connected to another mystery facing astrophysics, and that is subatomic fundamental particles called cosmic rays. These cosmic rays reach energies that reach to it and beyond millions of times higher energy than we can reach here on Earth in our human constructed particle accelerators. And we think neutrinos have something, some, some role to play in these two mysteries, some way that they can help us answer these two mysteries of black holes powering very bright galaxies and of the origins of cosmic rays. So what are neutrinos? Neutrinos are subatomic fundamental particles. They have zero charge, they have very low mass, and they travel vast distances through matter nearly without interacting at all. I think a lot of us are familiar with the idea of X-ray imaging. X-ray imaging allows us to see into, into objects that we could not otherwise. We can see inside of human bodies, we can see bones, other organs that are otherwise obscured to us. Also with the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can see night scenes, we can see objects in night scenes that are otherwise invisible to us. Neutrinos, because they travel great distances through otherwise opaque objects, are like super X-rays. They can provide super X-ray imaging of objects in the universe. And that's what the Super-K collaboration has done with the image on the, on the left here. This is an image of our own sun produced not in light, but in neutrinos. And so these neutrinos are emanating from the core of the sun that's otherwise invisible to us. Similarly, on the right, there was a supernova explosion that happened in 1987, and there were neutrinos that were detected from it there were so many neutrinos detected from it that physicists could calculate that the vast majority of the energy of this explosion, 99% of it, was produced not in light, but in neutrinos. In addition to these astrophysical topics, neutrinos, so neutrinos have been essential to explaining how stars live and die. In addition to that, these measurements have unveiled new discoveries, new information about particle physics. So that the idea of the ice cube collaboration of the project that we're talking about here today is to open up this idea of neutrino astrophysics, neutrino astronomy. And we're doing that in two ways, in two different frontiers. One is the distance frontier. We think this, that this idea of neutrino astronomy can be done across the universe to the edge of the visible universe to thousands of times greater distance than the supernova, which is in our cosmic backyard. And we also have the energy frontier. We think that there are neutrinos up to millions, even billions of times, maybe even greater energies, greater than these neutrinos from the sun and the supernova which are at modest energies and the units that the particle physicists use. So what is this ice cube project? It's a project, it's a detector that spans a billion tons of ice at the geographic South Pole. What we did is we constructed this project by drilling 86 holes and lowering sensors down into them. You can see the sensor on the left here. It's serving today as an illustrious sixth member of our panel today. And as Steve described, those sensors span this detector. They're monitoring this billion tons of ice. And we need that because I mentioned that neutrinos hardly interact with matter, but they do interact sometimes. So out of about a million neutrinos that reach the detector, one of them collides with an atom of ice, shattering it, producing a flash of light. These sensors detect this flash of light, send that signal up to the surface. And that's how we can calculate and measure the energy and the direction from which each neutrino arrived and thereby do neutrino astronomy. 
Of course, as Steve mentioned, the sensors cannot do this work alone. They depend on hundreds of scientists. So it really required this teamwork between hundreds of scientists to conceive, design, construct, operate, and analyze the data from this detector. On the left is one of these sensors starting its journey down into the ice. It's traveling up to two and a half kilometers down into the ice. On the bottom right is the building where the computers and electronics sit that record this data from the sensors in the ice. And here are two examples of the large teams of people that made all this work possible during the construction phase, which lasted from 2003 to 2011 at the National Science Foundation's Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. Here's a photo of the, over, of the Ice Cube collaboration, which consists of over 350 scientists from 58 institutions spanning 14 countries. This is at our meeting in Madison a few weeks ago. So what has Ice Cube discovered? As soon as we finished building Ice Cube, analyzing the first year or two of data, we started seeing events like the one on the left, which are lighting up the entire detector. They're very bright, very high energy events with thousands of TeV of energy. On the right is a visualization of, the th of three of the messengers that Dr. Caldwell mentioned. In green is photons, the highest energy type of photons, which are gamma rays. In the middle are neutrinos, and on the right are cosmic rays. The horizontal axis on this plot sh shows you the energy of each of these three messengers. The vertical axis tells us the energy density of these messengers in the local universe. In other words, the amount of energy that's reaching the Earth every second. And the fascinating thing is that neutrinos are as important as bright on this scale as the other two messengers. And so the universe is somehow glowing brightly in neutrinos, in these very high energy neutrinos. And that's a fascinating discovery. As far as we can tell, it's isotropic, and we're trying to understand what's producing this glow of neutrinos. So how do we do that? We, of course, make a map of the sky. We are neutrino astronomers, after all. And here's what it looks like. To interpret this map, I first need to explain that there's a large background that we're looking for these signals in. When the cosmic rays that I mentioned collide with Earth's atmosphere, they produce 90 billion atmospheric muons per year in the detector and 80,000 atmospheric neutrinos. The muons are relatively straightforward to reject to focus on neutrinos. And then we make this map of the neutrinos and we look for individual directions in which there's an excess from an astrophysical source that stands out above the background. This is a, an analysis that was published two years ago. And the hottest spot on the sky, according to this color scale, which is a clustering metric, we're looking for the degree of clustering at each point on the sky. The most significant degree of clustering on the sky is this spot colored in orange. Consistent with the direction of that orange spot, is a particular galaxy. And it's the same galaxy that I showed on that first slide. It's called NGC 1068, also known as Messier 77. And it's consistent with having 50 neutrinos in our data that arrived from that galaxy. Now, the question that we have to answer is, could the atmospheric backgrounds do that by chance? Could they fluctuate in a way that it looks like there's an excess there, but it's just a, a statistical uh, excess from a background fluctuation? We calculated the likelihood of that and the, the statistical significance of this excess in this two-year data set, in this publication from two years ago was 2.9 sigma. Now we've been working to reprocess, recalibrate, and reanalyze our entire data set with new methods. And my colleague, Elisa Risconi will tell you about that. So thank you, Justin, and thank you, Audrey, for this great summary and introduction. And yes, I mean, IceCube is an amazing uh, telescope. It's always on and monitors 4 pi the entire sky. So to get better, one can simply say, well, let's wait longer, like exposure from a standard camera. But of course, we did not only wait longer. We, as Justin just said, we improved our understanding of the telescope from the understanding of the optical properties uh, at the, of the ice, where IceCube is embedded up to the very sophisticated machine learned based reconstructions that we use to filter, extract the, the few neutrinos that at the end, that might reveal something fundamental in the universe. And so without making you waiting too long, it is my great pleasure on the behalf of the entire ASCO collaboration to reveal to you today, the new sky map of IceCube. So now you might wonder, what I'm supposed to look into this map. And you're right, it's not that obvious. Uh, so this is a little bit like a topographic map uh, in which you are looking for elevations. 
And so actually our goal is to search the most significant elevation in this entire Northern Hemisphere. So where is our Mount Everest uh, then? It is right at the equator. And it is composed by about 81 neutrinos that comes distributed on the energy spectrum with the power law of about 3.2. It is located at 0 0.09 degrees declination and in right ascension is 40.69 degrees. So the next question is, is there is a source aligned to this accumulation, to this cluster of neutrinos? And coherently respect what uh, Justin has just shown you and coherently with what actually in IceQ we have been seeing over the years uh, accumulating, indeed there is an object. And before arriving to the object, uh, I have to tell you that uh, we are very careful in this type of searches. And we select before actually looking to the map, before knowing where a possible Mount Everest might be, a list of 110 objects. These are you know, very strong uh, gamma ray emitters, X-ray emitters, uh, usually actually most of them extragalactic objects. You have highlighted here in this map with the black circle. And so, out of these 110 objects, indeed one is aligned with this accumulation in the sky. And this is NGC 1068, a nearby active galactic nuclei. From the specific position of NGC 1068, we detect 79 plus minus about 20 neutrinos. Again, distributed on a power law of about 3.2 spectra index in energy. Good. It's not yet time to open the champagne because we still have one fundamental question to answer. How many times this alignment happen just by chance? Are we actually sure? How can we be sure that the neutrinos are actually coming from such an object? And so for answering this question, and again, the collaboration is extremely careful in this operation, we generate 500 million times the same experiment that we are running at the South Pole. Don't worry, we do not build 500 million ice cube. We just generate this uh, on computer in simulations that are actually uh, requiring a, a, lot, a lot of service and resources from the collaboration. So out of these 500 million, we know that only one time in 100,000 of these experiments, we would see just by chance such alignment of 80 neutrinos from one of the 110 objects selected. This then brings us to claim that we have evidence for neutrino emission from NGC 1068, corroborated by a global significance of 4.2 sigma. So I'll break back to your first question. Do we have a steady source? I think we made it actually. Okay, well, now that you hopefully are interested, you might wonder, but what is this NGC 1068? Well, it's a spectacular object uh, that astronomers are studying since uh, decades. Uh, so we are very lucky in a sense because we can access to this amazing understanding of this object. It is the prototype safer to galaxy, which means it is an obscure galactic nuclei, as you see in the, in the zoom in of the picture. So what does it mean that a supermassive black hole in, at the center of the galaxy remain obscure to most of the radiation that we might want to see? And you see that 68 does not show a strong dominant jet, has an outflow from the center, and the hosting galaxy is a starburst galaxy. This means that there are several points, several areas in this object that might produce particle acceleration. And this means also might be the source of our neutrinos. If we would be able to dive close to the supermassive black hole and go beyond these uh, very dust thick clouds, as in this uh, artistic impression, close to the supermassive black hole, we would also see an ultra hot gas, the so-called corona, of which origin is not yet clear, which again indicated also close to a massive black hole, something extremely energetic, probably acceleration of protons, is in action. All of these, or the seed of this all, actually, 
it is embedded in several papers uh, back in the 80s. I show you here one in which uh, uh, active galactic nuclei are thought to be extremely good accelerators for protons. You see also that NGC 1068 was already considered as a good candidate. And there is another element which is very important to highlight. Once there are protons accelerated and protons also interact, not only neutrinos are produced, but also a lot of gamma rays. Gamma rays can be produced, by the way, also through many other mechanisms. So once you start to compare a potential neutrino signal and a gamma ray signal, you expect that the gamma rays overshadow, over, uh, are in, in more abundance than the neutrinos. But also in this paper, people assume that if there is interaction and so an efficient neutrino production, the gammas will be also absorbed. And so they predicted a sort of an anti-coincidence between neutrinos and gamma, an obscuration of a neutrino source. Do we see that? Yes, and this support indeed the evidence claim that we just made. Here you see the energy spectrum of uh, the neutrinos here in blue with the spectral slope I just uh, mentioned to you, compared now in green on the low energy side of uh, the gamma ray detected by the Fermilat uh, satellite experiment. And here in lighter green, you have only upper limits from the magic telescope on La Palma, who spent many, many hours uh, trying to detect gamma rays from NGC 68, but indeed putting very significant upper limits on that region. Altogether, these uh, eight events from NGC 1068, 80 neutrinos from NGC 1068, together with the fact that the gamma rays are most probably not there, bring us to the conclusion that NGC 1068 is a cosmic obscured accelerator. So after that, now you might wonder, how does it work? how actually you really filter out out of these billions of events, so few neutrinos, and you can claim that uh, this guy comes from 47 million light years away. To answer this question, I invite here one of the principal analyzer that made this analysis happening. This is Hans Niederhausen. Okay, thank you, Lisa, and all the speakers that spoke before me. In the next 15 minutes, I have uh, the pleasure to uh, explain to you a little bit how we search for these astrophysical uh, accelerators, how we improve the search for the result that we've been presenting today, and then I'll loop it back to the results and provide some additional information. And so let me take a bigger step back. So this is our telescope. You have seen it before in Justin Vandenbroek's uh, presentation. And what this shows you now is how one of the neutrinos uh, that contributes to, to the result that we are reporting today, how that neutrino looks like in our telescope. And I should actually correct myself because what you are seeing here is not a neutrino. What you're seeing is a muon, that's a subatomic particle that's being produced when the neutrino interacts somewhere near the detector. And then it travels from the left to the right through, through our, through our uh, telescope and it leaves a trace, a track of, of, of light emission and so the reason why I know that this goes from the left to the right is because if you look at the color scale, oh, sorry, I clicked one too fast or two too fast, actually. If you look at the color scale, the dark colors here uh, denote early in time while the lighter colors mean late in time. And then the size of these, of, of, of the, the way we, we, we scale the, the, the light sensors in size denotes how much light was seen. And so more light closer to, to the track. So now by eye, you know, you can roughly tell, okay, it goes from the left to the right. You cannot do astronomy with that. So we need, we need, we need to do more. And to, to do more, we actually have to understand our electric well, because what the electronics records, and we call this waveforms, is essentially just an electrical signal as function of time. And that encodes kind of how the light was received uh, as function of time. And then if we have all these signals from all the, all the sensors that actually did, met, met the detection during the event, we can combine that and run it through our computer algorithms and then reconstruct three main quantities, the direction, that's really what we, what we want. We can do that to much better than one degree. Uh, we, we are interested in the energy, uh, kind of sort of how much light is there. 
and then also an estimate of how well we can actually tell, tell the direction. So now this was just one event. In fact, we have, as uh, people mentioned already, we actually have 670,000 of them by now. Tracks, track events like the one I just presented, they're shown here on the, on, on, on the plot on the right, the entire data set, uh, the, the number of neutrinos as function of the estimated energy. And uh, I should mention that these 670,000 neutrino events that we have selected so far, these were detected from 2011 to 2020 in a nine year period. And okay, let me also highlight that actually in that time span, we have made about 1 trillion detection of events in total. Now, most of them are, are backgrounds for us. It's, the, it's, it's cosmic ray interactions in the atmosphere. So that those are kind of boring, but we've, we've you know, spent, you know, almost 10, 10 years now to, to, to really uh, select neutrinos with that purity that we have. Not only that, we have over the, uh, the, the nine years that we've been operating or, or more than that, we've made lots of progress in understanding exactly the, the, the you know, light transport in the ice, electric, uh, the electrical response, et cetera, et cetera. And we have, you know, as what, what I try to show you in this cartoon here, what we've essentially done is we have improved our understanding of the telescope since the very early days when we started recording, which leads to, I tried to show here in the color scale, somehow the improvements in data quality as function of time. And now most recently, what our signal clusters and we, we essentially hunt for this peak in two dimensions. On top of that, uh, we use the energy because the energy spectra are different or believed to be different in a way that uh, astrophysical sources should produce more high energy neutrinos than, than our backgrounds do. And so this is the, this is the principle with, with which we are searching. But we have actually, you know, for this analysis improved in both areas. We have improved the direct construction of directions and energy and also the modeling and in particular how they differ between signal and background. And so I'm just giving you two examples now. One example, uh, how we improved with directions. And I'm, bringing the, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain this on uh, using two events that we actually associate with NGC 1068. Let's look first at the event here on the, on, on the left. I want you to focus on the histogram denoted by the dots with arrow bars. And this histogram shows you uh, simulated neutrinos that have similar properties than the one that we've actually observed in the data. And what the horizontal axis gives you is the angular distance of our directional reconstruction to the simulated source, okay? And so this is telling us how our, how our telescope points with that particular neutrino. And then obviously for the search, we have to somehow have a model for that pointing. And the model is shown by the solid lines and the two colors show you the difference between the uh, previous simulations and previous model assumptions and current simulation and cur current model assumptions. And what you see is that for this event, both match quite well, uh, but you know, a little bit better than the new work, fine. But then there's other events like these. These are typically very well reconstructed low energy events. They're a little bit harder. And what makes them harder is that uh, our standard model that we had used previously does not really uh, so well match our simulation prediction of how we could point with that, with, with, with that neutrino event. So now with the new statistical techniques, we are able to fully capture uh, our, our, what, what we learned from simulations, how our pointing should work. And you see that the, that the, that the new analysis captures that much better. Okay, so that, that's directions. We've also improved energies. Uh, and what I show you again here is now the improvement in our energy reconstructions against uh, simulate, simulated neutrinos. Lots and lots of them that we, uh, where we know the true muon energy. And we also then uh, apply our reconstruction techniques on the left is the other analysis, on the right is the new analysis. And what this uh, essentially shows you, the simulations is make up this blue band here, many, many simulated neutrinos. The axis uh, on, the, on the vertical scale, that's, that's what are the reconstructed value that we're getting for these. And on the X axis, this is the true value that was simulated, which means that the perfect, uh, the perfect reconstruction would just put all the blue band into this black line, which is when the reconstructed value matches the true, okay? And what you see is that uh, then that, that obviously, uh, so you want that the, essentially uh, the, 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 the white line, which is the, the, the peak of the blue band, lines up with the, with the black line, and you want that the width of the blue band shrinks towards, towards the black line, because that's the ideal case. Now, what you see on the right, this is where we've made improvement. We have introduced machine learning tools for, to do this. Uh, it's a neural network, actually. And what you see is that the white line now matches perfectly with the, with the black line as, as, as we want in this uh, 100 G to 10 TB energy region that's important for, for this particular source that we're talking about, NGC 1068. And you see also that the width of the blue band is smaller. So this, these are the two metrics, how you, how, you, how you can talk about energy reconstructions and we improved in both. 
Okay, so now these were improvements in the description of essentially single event reconstructions and pointing and energies and so on so far. But how does it actually translate in, in terms of making all searches better for, for essentially a single neutrino sources with, with a larger number of neutrinos? And so to, to, to show you that what we simulated now is, an, is a signal uh, from a NGC 1060 at like point source with essentially 80 neutrinos, okay? And then with these 80 neutrinos, we are essentially trying to apply our techniques. And on the left, we try to re, uh, re, redetermine the lo location of the, of the true source in the simulations and see if we can get a match. And so what this shows you on the axis is the angular distance of our determination of the location of the source relative to what we injected. And you see in blue, that's, that's the new analysis methods. The simulations, the peak is closer to, to, the, uh, to, to, uh, to, the, to zero, which would be the position of the source compared to the orange histogram. If you put that in numbers, that's an improvement of about a uh, resolution improvement of about 25%. And we can read we can read off somewhere here that this is an, that that we typically can point with the neutrinos of the, of the order of 0.1 degrees at the energies that that, that make up uh, our source, and then this improvement in source localization, but also the the energy measurement, then also leads us to to expect an uh, an increase in significance where we essentially analyze these simulated uh, signals on top of background under both analyses and then recorded the difference in significance between mu and old. Okay, we've done more changes that I won't have the time to talk about, um, but we can go uh, now, now closer in, or, or have a deeper look into our results. This figure was shown before. This is essentially the patch of the sky around NGC 1060, 10, 1068, that is this red dot. If you now zoom in into this, onto the scale at which we have extra resolution for a signal like that, then we, here in, 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 in white, I'll show you the best fit localization in terms of with our algorithms. The, uh, Contour here that shows our directional uncertainty for that uh, the, that points of signals so of the uncertainty on the lo localization on the location of a potential neutrino source, and you see NGC 1068 it's right here at about 0.1 degrees away from the source exactly as you know we would expect from that kind of signal well consistent with our statistical uncertainties. So that makes our our, our the location of our, our of our hotspot well consistent with the physical signal from NGC 1068. So then in terms of statistical significance, uh, Elisa Rasconi already mentioned the 500 million computer experiments that we have performed where we simulated universes that don't have a, a neutrino source in there, there's pure backgrounds. And we've tried to search for the point of, of strongest clustering. And we have a metric that measures somehow how strong the clustering is. And all these 500 million computer experiments that we performed you know, on, on computer farms all over the world with you know, lots, of, lots of resources uh, spent on by our collaboration, uh, we have essentially uh, you know, determined that, that the uh, a signal as a clustering as strong or stronger only happens in something like 10 to the minus five cases, which then translates to 4.2 sigma if you account for the fact that uh, in our catalog, we've, we had 110 objects. Okay, I'm zooming out again. Uh, I hope you can follow me. So this is the, the zoomed out version again of the, of, the, of the order of a few degrees. And I'm, I mark here a circle that has a diameter of two degrees. And then I'm giving you all the neutrino events that we observe within these two degrees on a distance scale that is the angular distance squared. We squared just so that the background uh, appears uh, flat here and on, 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 this is just a 2D thing that happens. And what you see is that the data follows very, very, very nicely our background expectation until to the left, we're moving close to the source. And then you see how the data starts to rise above the, the background here in orange. And the way it is rising, exactly matches what uh, this excess is in blue, which is our simulated neutrino signal of, of, of that kind. And that, that's telling us that essentially now we are really well modeling this kind of signal. And, you know, this, this, this makes this match just so, 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 yeah, so nice, essentially. Okay, so then my last slide, just highlighting the two main, uh, main contributions and our improvements that made this result possible. This is number one, this increase in data quality. So the accumulation of understanding that the collaboration has uh, managed over the last many years, um, especially the, the updated calibration and then uh, applying all the latest reconstruction, et cetera, to this data set that we call PASS2. And then also these, the improvements in the statistical treatments that, that I've just described. And so just to highlight a little bit of evolution, this is uh, the result that we presented two years ago. Then this is the final result on the very right that we have now, where, where we have the uh, improved data quality and the improved methods. You see this well localized uh, local uh, localized uh, uh, mission here. 
And then in between, uh, we, we've, we've just shown you one, 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 one uh, example that splits up the two contributions, where we've essentially tried to revert back the data to the data quality that we had before, which we call pass one, but still applied the, uh, the new techniques. You see that the spot is a little bit wider than, you know, or, yes, it's wider than what, what, what we have finally, but we still see an in increased significance compared to the previous, re previous result that's then purely due to the, the new method. So from the left to the right, old result, old data quality, old methods, then uh, the new methods of data quality and putting both together that gives us then the final final result and the final confidence in this result. And so with those words, I'd like to hand it to Ignacio Tabuada, who gives us um, a deeper insight into the physics implications. Thank you very much, Hans, and thank you very much to all the previous speakers. So I will tell you about the impact on this result, and I will also tell you about uh, what is next for IceCube now that we have uh, evidence for neutrinos from uh, NGC 1068. And to think about what is next, it is good to look at the history of what happened uh, with neutrino astronomy in Antarctica. Um, the concept of, of neutrino telescopes in deep water goes back to the early 60s. But using Antarctica itself is an idea that was developed in 1988. Um, these led to initial tests in Greenland and then South Pole Station uh, that led to the construction of Amanda Telescope, which finished as Amanda II in the year 2000. In the year 2001, we published um, the observation of atmospheric neutrinos, which validated the technique of observing high energy neutrinos at the at the South Pole and led directly to the construction of the IceCube Neutrino Observatory. The IceCube Neutrino Observatory, as has been mentioned, took about a decade uh, to build and uh, construction finished in 2011. We have been operating in almost continuously from, um, since uh, May 2011 with the complete detector. Uh, the first observation has already been alluded, astrophysical observation that is, has been already been alluded to, which is the discovery of astrophysical uh, neutrinos. These astrophysical neutrinos come from all directions, more or less with equal probability, which tells you that the origin is likely extragalactic. However, the specific sources that were responsible for these uh, extragalactic neutrino flux had not been identified. In 2018, uh, we found the first candidate neutrino source is a source named TXS05066, long names, so I will just call it TXS from now on. Um, and um, um, I'll tell you a little bit the properties of this a little bit later. In 2021, one specific event was identified that is very interesting, it's a glacial resonance event. And it is because the way that neutrinos interact with matter has a very specific channel, the glacial resonance channel, in which you get neutrinos of the very specific energy, 6.3 uh, peta electron volts, that produce a very specific signature. And it was, um, you know, validation of uh, calibration of the energy scale of the detector, particle physics, and many other things that we have found an event like this. And then now we have the presentation of this source, NGC 1068, also known as Messier 77, that are presenting evidence for neutrinos in their direction uh, today. Let me tell you about the scientific implications of, of this uh, observation. Um, the first is that active galaxies uh, probably produce a significant fraction of the extragalactic neutrino flux. Active galaxies are those that uh, have a supermassive black hole in their center. That is actually true for almost all large galaxies. But in the case of active galaxies, you also have an accretion disk of matter that falls into the dry, into the black hole and produces a, a very intense uh, radiation. So both the excess and Messier 77 are active galaxies. And this plot that you see here on the right um, in the gray band and also the error bars, you see two methods for measuring the extragalactic um, diffuse flux of neutrinos. And, uh, and then you see also the fluxes of NGC 1068 or Messier 77 in blue and TXS in, in orange. You can see that each one of the sources individually represents maybe 1% 
of the contribution to the total diffuse extragalactic flux. So it means that we have only beginning to scrape the surface, the surface as far as finding new sources is concerned. There must be many other sources that are far dimmer than NGC 1068 that are hiding somewhere to be found. Then another important conclusion is that NGC 1068 is opaque to high energy gamma rays. This is very interesting because we had already in multiple ways expected this. If you look at the gray band, you see that that is a little bit steep. And that means that the spectrum is relatively soft. You have relatively more low energy neutrinos than high energy neutrinos. And you can do a calculation, one that I will not have time to detail right now, in which compare the neutrino observations by IceCube and high energy gamma observations by the Fermilat Observatory. And you can show that to be consistent, neutrino sources have to be um, opaque to gamma rays. Then the final observation I want to make is that NGC 1068 and TXS uh, look very different. Even though they're both active galaxies, their properties appear to be quite different. You can, at first glance from the plot itself, you can see that the energies at which we have observed them are very different. We have observed NGC 1068 from roughly one tera electron volt to roughly 10 tera electron volt. Whereas TXS, we have seen from roughly 100 tera electron volt to peta electron volt energy scales. Um, this is in part because of the energy spectrum, but I wonder if you know there's more to that. Another difference is that TXS is a time variable source. That's how it was identified because it had two periods of neutrino emission, whereas TXS is a steady source or a very slow bearing. Uh, source uh, with time. And then final difference I want to highlight is that NGC 1068 is about 100 times closer than TXS. So this could be telling us that there are at least two different types of populations that are uh, driving the uh, astrophysical extragalactic neutrino flux. Um, IceCube is getting better. That was the main message of this presentation. You see that by reanalyzing our data with better methods and better calibration, we have obtained better sensitivity. And I can tell you that we're not finished doing that. You can expect, not very far in the future, more results from IceCube that will repeat this trick. We will reanalyze that data. We will use better methods. We will you know, improve multiple things and it will have more impactful uh, results. That's for another day. Um, then also we will be adding new instrumentation to the ICE in the um, Austral summer of 2025, 2026 at the South Pole. This is the so-called IceCube upgrade. The IceCube upgrade will allow us to study the ICE in the South Pole better. And that will allow us to improve the angle of resolution to neutrinos like the ones we have studied today. Therefore, we will improve the sensitivity of the detector as a whole. There's going to be a future generation of IceCube, IceCube Gen 2, that will have about an order of magnitude larger volume and five times better the sensitivity to point sources that will clearly blow away what we're doing with NGC 1068 right now and reveal significantly more number of sources. And scientifically, I want to conclude with this figure that I have there on the right. Um, this is a result that has already been shown by several. I want to highlight one really cute detail here. The little red circle in the neutrino observations, that is the optical size of the galaxy. You see that I'm zooming out to the picture by with the Hubble Space Telescope. That picture fits in that little red circle. Let me make some acknowledgments that are very important. Um, let me first begin with the IceCoop collaboration. As you heard, 58 countries, uh, sorry, 58 institutions, 14 countries, more than 350 collaborators. Here you have a picture on the left of the last digital optical module that was deployed in the construction of IceCube. In the middle, you have a picture of the two current wind trovers. These are people that stay for a full year at the South Pole Station to run the experiment. And at the right, you have another collaboration meeting. And I chose a simple, another picture just to show 
you know, diversity of locations for our meetings. And this one was in, in Chiba in Japan in 2019, pre-COVID times. And uh, as you heard, improved calibrations, data reprocessing operations had a very significant impact in the, in the output, the result that we're presenting today. It is clear that this is something that could only happen in a collaboration. And these improvements are the work of many significant people in the collaboration. It is also appropriate to acknowledge the significant support we get with the United States um, Antarctic program and via the operational logistics at the South Pole Station. I leave you this map for one second to look at. This is the map of all the institutions that are part of the ISCO collaboration. And then I turn to acknowledge the funding agencies. The, the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory was built principally with contributions from the National Science Foundation in the United States, but also with contributions from um, other countries. Um, the operations of the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory is a grant here at the University of Wisconsin at Madison uh, by the National Science Foundation and that also gets common con fund contributions from all countries that participate uh, in Ice Cube, and then the scientific use of the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory data is made possible by all the funding agencies that you see listed here. So with that, I want to thank you very much for being here, and I leave you with the main message for today. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio and all the speakers. And so we are now uh, opening the floor for questions. Let's first see if we have questions in this room and we can also later, we can also check if they are online questions. Any questions here? Yes. Um, when you showed the sky map with the 110 possible sources, you know, it looked kind of clear that most of them had no neutrinos or clustering. Is there some significance to that as well? Can we make statements about other potential sources of neutrinos not uh, being detected in your detector? Well, it, we never quantify. So the only thing that we quantify once we do not see neutrinos from these 110 sources is that if this is compatible with expectation, of course, a significant under fluctuation would be very worrisome, would be something that, of course, would, would be in detailed, uh, dissected. We never had actually <laughs> that specific case, uh, but as in the paper that will appear tomorrow, there are a couple of uh, more objects that are appearing, not the same level of NGC 68. These are Texas 0506, uh, as Ignacio mentioned, is also uh, keep present in, in this uh, analysis, as well another uh, blazer, PKS 1424, which looks very, very similar in many aspects to Texas 0506. But today we decide to focus the message on NGC 68. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, so Jim? Yeah, I have a couple questions from online. Um, first one is, uh, what is the significance you would get if you apply the new version of the data to the TXS event? Would the significance be larger than the previous results? Okay, uh, that is an interesting question. We don't have the exact answer to that. And that's because for this analysis, we've only analyzed time integrated emission. So that's a different hypothesis in the previous TXS result, we had looked for uh, time clustering, structure and time. We have analyzed uh, the time integrated emission and the time integration, uh, time integrated significance is uh, similar to, almost identical to what the time, time integrated uh, significance was in the analysis two years ago with the previous data. So first of all, congratulations for this wonderful result. 
so you mentioned about 80 events coming from this particular source so how can you be so confirmed that there is no other source very close by contributing to these 80 neutrino events because we have a resolution so is there any comment that you want to make okay there's uh, there's essentially two points to that uh let me say that there's, there's, there's the physical argument that you can make about distance and the plausibility of the kind of object that, that, that is emitting these neutrinos, uh, in which NGC 1068 just looks very, very favor favorably. In the scenarios that were described, you can, you can, you can make uh, phenomenological slash theoretical arguments why this would be the most prominent, promising source in the northern sky. So that's the, the, the sort of theory side of, this, of, the, of the question or the answer. And then there's, of course, the experimental side. And there it's, it boils down to uh, the statistical argument that essentially uh, the statistics is, is tied to our catalog selection. So the significance in some sense would, would only be associated uh, to objects that are in the catalog, in which case there, there is nothing else in the catalog anywhere near. If you remove the catalog and you, you say, okay, you allow any kind of object, any far away, somewhere, you know, if, if you ask that question, then the problem becomes much, much trickier because then we're reducing it back down to what the all sky search is without a catalog. And so we discuss uh, the significance of that hotspot there, uh, which then, you know, it, it is lower. It by itself is not that large of a number. And then you wouldn't actually be asking your, your, your question in the first place just because then there's no, there's no excess, right? And so the, the result of your reporting really ties back to that we have uh, reduced the sky to these 110 candidate objects. Okay, so this significance is compared to the catalog that we have. And am I allowed to ask one more question? So, uh, Professor Ignacio mentioned about that this goes beyond detecting a source, but we are now unraveling the properties of the source. So, if you can kindly elaborate, like, I, 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 I see in the plot that you are measuring the energy with some error and some the direction, but do you have anything else apart from that like any 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 insight if you can give us so ob observationally like you mentioned there's the energy range over which they have been observed and and that to some extent is a is a consequence of the spect spectral index uh, the spectral index for ngc 1068 is relatively soft is 3.2 uh, whereas for TXS, it is relatively hard. I don't remember the number out of my head, but it's going to be close to two, maybe 1.9. Um, and that means that the energy ranges on which they're observed is very, very different. And it's just, you know, that's just the consequence of our observation. Um, then the other is that we know that um, um, TXS was found via time variable methods. So, and we find two periods, one in 2017, and then another in 2014, 2015, that we have two periods associated with uh, neutrino emissions. So you have something that is mostly quiet, and then you get a couple periods that you get neutrino emission. Um, NGC 1068, we actually have um, um, studied this, and it is relatively time independent or slowly bearing uh, with time. And that's another property that is uh, that is quite different. I don't know if that answers your specifics. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. We have one mess here back in the room. Keith, back to Okay. Uh, so a remarkable property of NGC 1068 is that it appears to be opaque in gamma rays, at least for the source of the neutrino mission. Uh, we have an abundant amount of multi-wavelength data about this galaxy, so we know a lot about its properties because it's so close. Uh, can you say more about what you think the expected neutrino emission region is? How close is it to the central engine? So, so this is a question that will be answered in the next years, I think, with uh, many, many more works. Uh, I guess today, without uh, jumping too rapidly in conclusion, uh, we can for sure identify three possibilities. So the, the outflow that is uh, present, although most probably not energetic enough to produce so many neutrinos, uh, the hosting galaxy, which is a starburst galaxy, um, probably uh, quite strong, but also transparent. This means that the gamma ray should be there. And the third option that seems today the most favorite one 
It's really the one related to this corona, uh, or this X-ray field that is uh, present uh, close to the supermassive black hole. This means that the emission region will be probably very close to the supermassive black hole within the obscured region. And what will probably happen is that the neutrinos will be the only way to go through these clouds. And so this all will require a lot of modeling, a lot of uh, theoretical calculation, and a lot of collaboration with the astronomers to understand precisely where the emission is. We do not have the resolution in terms of angle resolution to pin down uh, the, the region of emission. Uh, so I think there are multiple options. This is very interesting. Uh, but will require a lot of more work. We are not yet there. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to kind of paraphrase a few questions uh, to uh, speed things along. So one following up on the characteristics of this source, you mentioned that this was a star forming region. Is it possible that the neutrinos could be associated with the star forming aspects rather than the black hole? Yeah, uh, Keith mentioned that the subject is very bright in gamma rays, and Elisa mentioned that it should be transparent in those gamma rays. And so there are two basic ideas of how these objects could be producing neutrinos and gamma rays. One is the star forming activity and one is the supermassive black hole. And because the neutrinos are so bright, they're brighter than the gamma rays, that's why we think it's this very dense inner region close to the black hole and not the star formation activity. Great. And then there's a number of questions about statistics. Okay. Um, and uh, so I, I'll give you a yes, a chance, yes or no. Did you do the statistics right? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh. <laughs> okay. Good. Honesty is always important. Uh, and then the next question was, um, how much time do you think it would take to go from 4.2 sigma to 5 sigma? Uh, that is an interesting question because it comes with large statistical uncertainties. Uh, and that is because essentially not all, not all neutrinos that we see are equal. Because as I, I showed you two examples, uh, for example, in the pointing on the pointing slide, um, we have neutrinos that, that, that we can point better with uh, compared to others. The, the nicest ones that give us essentially the best pointing information, they're, they're, they're quite rare. And so essentially, even if I, if, you know, if I, if I tell you it's gonna take five years that's, that, that would just be some sort of average. And it really depends on, on the mixture of how, how kind nature is to us, the kind of neutrinos we're getting. It can be faster if you're getting you know, a few nice ones and it can take much longer if, if somehow you know, the, it's not playing in our favor that way. Are we, any other questions? Uh, I think we have used the hour, but if there's a, a, Anything else online, Jim, that needed attention or? Um, why don't we go through a couple of quick hitters, okay? Uh, any neutrinos associated with gravitational waves? Every time a gravitational wave occurs, we search immediately. Ice Cube can view the entire sky, both hemispheres all the time. So we search for everyone. And so far we have not found a coincidence, but we can't wait to. Um, maybe a quick question about Ice Cube Gen 2. Um, what will that geometry look like? Um, and uh, uh, any, a few details maybe about that. So we're talking a, about a detector that will be in the scale of um, amount of instrumentation, not that different uh, from Ice Cube. It will be more, but it will be dramatically more. It's just that the instruments will be further apart. So we'll be studying a different energy range, a slightly energy range. It would dramatic, significantly overlap with Ice Cube, but it will be beginning a slightly uh, larger energy. Um, the strings in Ice Cube are separated by about 125 meters in Gen 2 by uh, about 250 meters. And uh, we're talking about 86 strings for, uh, for Ice Cube, an order 100, 100 to 20 uh, for Gen 2. And, um, and um, the instrumented volume for um, Gen 2 is eight cubic kilometers compared to one for, for Ice Cube. And all that put together, including larger sensors and better sensors than the one that we have here, because this was a state of the art in the year 2000, and we were building a state of the art for now. Um, and all that would result in um, uh, 
a five times better sensitivity to point sources. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Well, uh, I don't see any further hands. So with this, thanks. Let's thank all the speakers again and uh, everybody also online.